Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing my analysis into epistemology. The text that I'm using is the Blackwell Philosophy Anthologies on Epistemology. It's edited by uh, Ernest Sosa and um, Kim. <clears throat> so make sure you get Sosa and Kim. This book is the book that I'll be using to navigate the lectures. As you guys know, if you want to access the notes, click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF as I continue my lecture. I'll update my notes. If you want to get the most up-to-date version of my notes, just click the link and uh, make sure that you have the most up-to-date version. In this lecture, I'm continuing the analysis into Barry Stroud's The Problem of the External World. It's on it's between pages 6 and 23 of that text. And we are on page 3 of my notes. So, page 3 of my notes, section 1.1. Um, make sure you supplement the video lecture and my notes with the book. The book goes into far more detail than I'm going to be able to go to in the lecture series. And with that, let's begin our analysis of epistemology. Alright, so epistemology. And this is section 1.1. Okay, so we're at the uh, bottom of page three of my notes. So we're going to discuss reassessing knowledge, right? And Stroud up, to, up until this point has really just set the very, very, very basic conceptual framework for understanding epistemology, the relationship between knowledge and belief um, we discussed in the last section. In this section, we're going to discuss the ways in which we analyze Right, and this is important, right? The ways in which we analyze how we think, how we organize and process and sort information. We're going to begin very, very gradually and we'll eventually um, complicate it a little bit more. So, this is reassessing knowledge. Okay, uh, direct quote from page seven. Um, quote We do sometimes discover that we do not really know what we previously thought we knew. We discover sometimes that we don't know what we thought we knew, right? I might find that what I previously believed is not even true, right? So the idea is that with respect to our knowledge, our knowledge of some state of affairs X, right? With respect to our knowledge, our knowledge of some state of affairs X is in itself flexible, right? This state of affairs we might discover at some point in time later, right? So we are at time T1 and then we get to time T2 and we recognize that from time T1 to time T2 I knew X and then by the time I get to time T2 I realize that I don't know X, right? There was this time when I thought I knew, then I recognized that I didn't know, then you can, you know, it, it, it can oscillate. <clears throat> so it's sort of basic, I don't want to complicate that more than it needs to be. We do sometimes discover that we do not really know what we previously thought we knew. I might find that what I previously believed is not even true, right? So my lecture series on non-monotonic logic looks into this in, um, in more mathematical terms in terms of non-monotonic logic and in non-monotonic logic the idea coupled with my example of the ABC murder story is to show it precisely how our knowledge um, transforms, right? Our knowledge of a state of affairs X can transform from a state where we don't know to a state where we do know or conversely from a state where we thought we knew to a state where we recognize we in fact did not know. And we'll talk more about that in detail, right? Okay. So, um, see page 17 of my notes, click the hyperlink, and it'll take you um, exactly to where I'm discussing. And the corresponding video for a detailed explanation of the function of non-monotonic logic, which is what I just explained. Um, and the idea is, I've already done a lecture series that will supplement this supplement, right? So, meta-supplemental um, uh, educational tools that I've offered you. So, you know, take the time out, watch it you'll have a richer, fuller understanding of exactly how we can describe and make sense of this transformational character 
in our epistemological access. Uh, and it's not a fixed state of affairs, right? We're not talking about dogmatic claims. All right, so that's number two. Number three, the author wants to understand, quote, what exactly the problem of our knowledge of the external world amounts to. Right? So the, the question becomes, what exactly, Stroud's attempt, Barry Stroud's attempt is to make sense of what exactly does it mean to say that there is a problem of the external world, right? What is, what is the character of the problem of our knowledge of the external world? And we'll see exactly what that problem is, right? The nature of that problem, right? What exactly is the character of the problem of our knowledge of the external world, right? How do we come to understand the nature of the problem? And you can, you can conceptualize this before we get um, a little bit deeper. And as I said, this is an introduction to epistemology. So for you rooted epistemologists, this might be rather obvious and mundane. The idea is, however, if we if we progress through the series and the concepts gradually and we come to have an understanding of the nature of some of the complications in our awareness of some state of affairs X, whatever that might be, you might actually be able to learn something even at this introductory state, right? Because the idea basically, and this will be a bit obvious, is that we have a perceiver and the perceiver wants to understand the nature of some the external world, right? The, the question is, how is the character of this understanding complicated? Why is it that things can be difficult in me, as a perceiver, attempting to assess the external world? Descartes gives examples, we'll talk about this later, but the idea is, just from a very basic sort of ghetto level to begin, is it's, it's rather obvious. If I get intoxicated with narcotics or I get intoxicated with alcohol, my perception of the external world changes. Right? You might misperceive the depth of steps. And insofar as I've misperceived the depth of steps in my intoxicated state, I'm stumbling around, and obviously my brain is improperly processing um, the bits of sense data that I'm, that I'm receiving from the external world. This mismatch between what I think is there and what actually is there is problematic. But the problem is deeper than that because the question is, is it really there, right? What is there? What is, like, what is the nature of this, right? And this is part of the reason why you'll always have an association between metaphysics and epistemology prior to Kant, um, even, even after Kant, right? From an introductory standpoint, there's always, at this basic level of introduction, a relationship between metaphysics and epistemology. What is reality? What when we talk about existence, what do we mean? And then when we talk about our understanding and our awareness of this external world, what do we mean? So that metaphysics talks about the nature of reality and our epistemology talks about the nature of our understanding of reality. Uh, so you can see the, the overlap. Okay, top of page four. So um, A, in simpler terms, what does it mean to say that there is a problem, right? What does it mean to say that there's a problem with the acquisition of knowledge that we gain from the external world, right? The idea that there is a relation between the external world and my processing of that sense data is going to serve as, at least this level, the conceptual foundation for our, our understanding of the epistemological problem. Right? You can see then that where the world is in a sense fixed, and this is super ghetto, right? where the world is in a sense fixed, and my mind, because of intoxication as a gross example, um, distorts my perception of the world, we recognize what, that where there is not a correspondence between what I think and what exists, there's a breakdown in my relation to the world. Right? So, there needs, at least, the assumption at this level is that there needs to be some type of correspondence between the contents of my mind and what I think are and what exactly is, right? That, that's sort of obvious, right, at this level.